Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Logos Media's Unspun episode number 116. I'm here with, of course, my wife, Holly, and Mark Gordon Brown is joining us today. And uh, Mark has been doing research since, I think, what, the 80s, Mark, uh, on. And Mark, you might want to tip your camera down just a little bit so you're more in the shot. But, uh, and uh, Mark has been doing research on the rapture and the corruption of uh, Christianity, etc. Basically, it's pseudo Christianity. So, we actually have quite a lot of material and ground to cover today. It's probably going to need to be broken up into two shows. So, uh, we're going to just hit the, hit the ground running right now. Mark, welcome to the show. Holly, welcome again. Hi, Jan. Hi, Holly. How y'all doing? Doing great. Thanks so much for coming on. So uh, we're just going to start right off. And, you know, you sent us a PowerPoint presentation that we're just going to follow along for, for bullet points. And um, and then, uh, you know, if we need to share a screen and this or the second episode, we'll do that. OK, and um, I will say to everybody that the, all the pictures that are in the PowerPoint are ones that either I scan myself from my collection of um, religious uh, things from my uh, uh, parents. I have a few crates of them from things from the, well, stuff going, even going back into the, the 1920s about uh, uh, Christianity, fundamentalist Christianity and stuff, or, or things that I have um, gotten off the internet that are things I've vetted myself or have myself, just I found a better image on the internet. Sure, um, no, no problem. We don't need to explain uh, that um, stuff, but... I just showed them on the screen okay. some of the images so that they have an idea of some of what we'll be discussing. So let's just uh, dive right in. This, okay. is, this is we got, wow. This is going to be deep, folks. You know, and and just yeah. really, really quickly before you start, Mark. You know, Holly and I have been doing a lot of research in Salem, and we've done a number of shows on Salem and what we've found, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, regarding Salem, the the Puritans or Purim and the, you know, the Unitarians and the Quakers after them and the creation of Protestantism and what that's all about. And it's a constant severing of the Christian church and breaking up and distorting what it is really about. So you picked up on this on your own uh, from a wholly um, different angle. Yeah, um, basically it's because... My family was very involved in the church um, growing up, and that was my, my life, going to church with my family, uh, going and visiting the sick and the um, elderly, um, being with people that were bereaved uh, from a death in the family and stuff like that. My parents were those kind of people that were just there for everybody all the time. Um, and so was my, my grandmother. And they were living like, you know, the real good, good Christian life of being being you know being a good being good people but then uh, along in uh, the, our church sort of started changing along in the early 70s uh and it was all because of um, things like like great planet earth and these different movies that we're going to be discussing uh presenting this rapture doctrine and uh, tribulation antichrist thing where um the um there was this oh let me see where um, they started believing that the church and those who believed exactly in one specific little type of christianity were going to be taken up to heaven just beamed up there and then those who were left behind were going to have to stay and face um face the tribulation period of seven years um, where they would get, if they didn't get their head stamped uh, with a 666, then they would be damned, uh, they would they would be killed. But if they did that, they'd be damned forever. So we started getting a, a big influx of people coming into the church that were more just coming there because they were scared and didn't want to uh, didn't want to get left behind <laughs> face the right. antichrist well, or go to you hell. Know, I remember as a kid, you know, I went to a private Christian school for four years up through second grade, and it was a Seventh-day Adventist school. We weren't Seventh-day Adventists, but it was a private 
uh, Christian school that was like a block from our house and it was much better than the public school in the area. So we went there and I remember being taught all of this stuff at, in like, you know, first grade and how only a certain number of people were, would be saved and everybody else uh, would be, you know, left alone on the planet. You know, maybe your parents would go up and if you were five, you'd be left alone or whatever. You know, so this mm -hmm. was pretty, you know, scary stuff when you're like six, seven years old hearing this kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. And one, my first exposure to it when I was actually when I was 11, it's something we're going to be dealing with later in a, a certain film that was basically what brought this message to all the churches in the 70s, because let's face it, people watch films more than they read. And although there was a couple books prior to that that were making it sort of uh, popular within uh, the evangelical churches, be the charismatic movement um, until this one film came out, which we'll discuss later. It, it really wasn't that prevalent. People believed that in the evangelical churches I went to as a free Methodist and Nazarene churches um, to be specific, the ones I was going to at the time, um, they believed that Jesus was going to come back and then he was going to have the dead in Christ rise. And, um, everybody would go up in the air with him and fight Satan at the end of the world and things like that. But they didn't believe in this rapture thing where people were going to be left behind and have to deal with the antichrist. They just didn't, they, it just was not there. It was non-existent except in very fringe, fringe parts of the church. Um, yeah. Well, you know, and, and let me just say to people, yes, uh, we've been discussing over the last few weeks, the uh, channel name has changed. It's now Logos Media. GnosticMedia.com will be becoming LogosMedia.com. LogosMedia.com is active. I just have to do some more work. Holly and I also have a brand new channel uh, that I probably should have had a link for ready in the uh, notes here. I'll put it in the, in in the, the chat. chat. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> You know, please subscribe to that because we have to get a thousand uh, subscribers before we can, you know, make any money from that, etc. Uh, so uh, also we have uh, uh, what else was I going to say? Geez, uh, we have a new Patreon account that's linked in uh, the Logos Media channel or both channels. So you know, if you want to support that way, you can go to the channel. It should start showing up in other places as well, but. You know, this is, of course, uh, listener sponsored. So we appreciate everyone's help and support. Sorry, Mark, for cutting you off on that. I should have it's said that at problem. the beginning. We just have, you know, I'm like in a rush to make sure we get everything in. So sorry, go ahead. I'm, re I'm really easy going. So don't worry, don't worry. Um, so um, I wanted to address um, sort of a, another subject before we actually get into it more. Now, um, in our society, the views of heaven and Saint, or heaven, hell, and Satan aren't really coming from what's in the Bible and New Testament or even the Old Testament. Most of what our society as a whole gets their idea of heaven and hell from are coming from uh, works like uh, the writers of Dante, um, John Milton, Christopher Marlowe, Blake, Goethe, um, Swedenborg, uh, painters like Bosch and that whole school of, of that. So we have to keep that in mind because there's actually not a lot of references to hell and Satan in that whole spooky sort of way <laughs> in the Bible. There's just not. It, it's like I defy people to find them uh, if they really uh, look at the Bible and it's just not coming from there. So we have to, we have to keep that in mind as well, we go because Mark, a lot of these things are let me, let me add, you know, one of the things that I usually see out there when people ridicule Christianity, they'll bring up things like the rapture, et cetera, that aren't even in the Bible. And then they'll use that to rail against Christianity, you know? So. Yeah. So, so these things are, these things have been, my point is that these things have been this change and stuff and this pop culturing thing of, of, making like things like like Dante, Dante and Milton and Marlowe and Blake and Goethe and all them, they were pop culture of their day. Yeah. I mean people people think people think that people 
um, back then didn't have like a whole pop culture thing or like we have, but that was a pop culture that th their day. I mean, Dante was a, a pop, a pop writer. He was just along the same lines as say a Dan Brown or something. The same with Milton <laughs> and Marlowe, you know, and Marlowe and Blake and Goethe. I mean, the whole Faustus thing with Marlowe, Marlowe and Goethe, um, and you know, it goes into operas too and things like that. They were, they were, they were pop culture of the time. And you know, maybe the peasants didn't get it, but you know it's probably not as dire back then as people thought it was for, for like all, all the you know, little people and stuff like that. People, people were reading, people were doing, doing, you know, attending, attending plays, people were attending, attending concerts. I mean, even if you look at like shows like, um, like now, um, you know, Game of Thrones, they'll show, they'll show, um, uh, people go into these little street plays and stuff like that. And, and especially like the works of um, Marlowe and Goethe with the Faust, there was like little street plays all around Europe of, of the Faustus story. So, you know, all this, this devil and hell stuff basically is more coming from these pop culture sources, even, even in um, his, the histor historical pop uh, culture uh, sources and the romantic poets, of course, you know, um, oh, Lord Byron, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Shelley, things like that. You know, they, they brought in their whole ideas of what Satan was and Lucifer and stuff like that and added, uh, added you know, added it. And so that's where we're coming from as well, because it's going to play into, it's going to play into this whole, how this whole rapture, rapture antichrist thing plays out within society as a whole, because it's not just affecting Christianity, as we'll see as we go on, it's affecting all, all of, all of our culture. And I, I'm going, I'm going to show where it, it goes into, and goes into things like even, even like the walking dead is, a variation on this theme. Let me, you know, let me ask you this because I grew up going uh, the Christian school I went to was called Mesa Grande, which mm -hmm. is a Seventh-day Adventist school associated with the uh, famous Loma Linda University Medical System or Medical School and the Loma Linda Academy, which of course mm -hmm. is a Seventh-day Adventist town. Now, that's a vegetarian town where the New Testament is actually speaks against vegetarianism for one thing and calls those who eat only shrubs or vegetables weak. But, um, you know, there's a whole section in there about eating whatever is clean and good to eat. And so they, they take this, you know, but I noticed I think that was created by Ellen White. And that's out of the uh, burned over district in New York uh, that was uh, that uh, apparently let's see I think the Fox sisters were associated with that do you have you looked into any of that a little bit of the burned over but more more of, of what I looked into in the burned over district was um, just in regards to, to Mormonism um, where we're going with this though um, the rapture doctrine basically though is coming out of uh, Scotland in England and um, it's basically um, there was a um, um, a young a young girl Margaret MacDonald and her congregation in uh, Port Glasgow Scotland around uh, just one second here 18, um, 1829 1829, 18, 1826 to 1829, they started having these um, sort of um, uh, charismata events where they'd start prophesizing and speaking in tongues and uh, manifesting miracles and stuff like that. Now, um, all of uh, Britain sort of um, started hearing about this. So a group called the Plymouth Brothers uh, sent up... Um, uh, John Nelson Darby and uh, one of his associate, uh, an, another associate, just one second here, I gotta get my notes up. Um, and so, Benjamin uh, Wells. Newton. Yeah, Benjamin, Benjamin Wells um, to investigate. And now um, they, they said that um, this was, 
these people were experiencing um, demonic manifestations. But what happened afterwards is that um, John Nelson Darby, um, he started um, promoting this, coming up with this idea of um, dispensationalism and uh, Christian futurism, where um, basically dispensationalism is that God releases information to, or uncovers, reveals information in the Bible, um, Old Testament and New Testament to um, each generation as, it, as it's ready to um, hear it or needs it. So the idea of the rapture, what Darby was basically saying is, well, I'm uncovering this idea of the rapture now because you didn't need that before. And um, that, <laughs> excuse me, you didn't, you didn't need this before because it wasn't going to happen right away. What, what slide number are you on by chance? I'm on uh, number four, number okay. four. So, now, oh, yep. I'm, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to say that this connects in. I mean, it's kind of perfect timing because uh, Jan and I, with our research with Salem, we started to go forward into the early 19th century and uh, we connected Cotton Mather and Increase Mather's work to the first and second great awakenings in America. Mm -hmm. And it started to tie into the evangelical church and the, the American branches of Christianity. So the work that you're talking about with Darby and this starting up in England was connecting at the same time to the first and second great awakenings that we've looked into. Yeah, we've, yeah. you know, we've been looking at Protestantism as a whole and uh, the whole thing to us appears a fraud at this point, you know. And, you know, I mean, that's a bold statement to say, but uh, as far as Protestantism and, you know, we, you know, it's like something under their orthodoxy, whatever Tartary orthodoxy or something to, to that effect was there and was broken apart when Tartary collapsed. And then they all swooped in essentially and started breaking it apart as quickly as they could and fracturing it. You know, even today we have congressionalism, which is all of these, you know, a congressional church is, you know, there, it's just the church itself and the minister. There's not a, a larger group of churches yeah. outside that. And that's against the teachings of the New Testament. I also wanted to say uh, thank you. I belong in the kitchen for your $20 donation a minute ago. That's uh, really nice. And thanks for the comment. She says, great topic. So thanks so much. And thanks, Mark, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm trying my best. <laughs> I get a little bit tongue tied here. Who's, um, whose uh, volume is too high? Somebody's saying it might be mine. So my, no, know. my, my voice is screechy. Can you turn down mine at all? Your voice isn't uh, screechy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I disagree, but uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm, anyway, go ahead, Mark. Okay, so 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 Dar Darby he did this whole dis came up with this whole dispensation dis dispensation right thing, and uh, it's basically basically this guy's got a hell of an ego. I'm just, I mean sorry, but he's got a hell of an ego. He's just like saying, well, basically, okay, um, God just revealed all this stuff to me, and he's basing. He's basing a lot of it where his Eureka mode, but came from um, reading um, uh, 1 Thessalonians um, um, chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, and all the believers are going to be, we'll be we, we will be caught up in, in, in the air with, with Christ. Now, he's taken this from uh, the Latin Vulgate. And um, in this passage in Latin, is the word rapimir, which we get rapture from. And uh, basically he's taken this whole rapture thing from that particular line, nothing else. And there's nothing else to say. People are gonna go floating up in the air at all. And uh, <laughs> you know, I'm sorry to be so flippant about it, but I mean, this is kind of, this is kind of crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. I mean, 
<laughs> for even the person that believes, you know, believes in 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 Jesus and in God and supernatural things, it is kind of crazy that people are just going to start floating up in the air. And I'm sorry, but after it scared me as a kid, but now I'm just like, okay, are these people being serious? Or are they doing a joke? Right. Well, they, you know, people before they pick a church to do is read straight through and not go jumping around like well, like, well, spot reading like and, and spot reading is probably the single worst thing that you can do. Like. You know, I wrote some books uh, against Christianity in my 30s, and, you know, I would jump around and spot read throughout the Bible. When I actually sat down and read it as a book, like books are meant to be read, then it was totally different, you know, and it was like, wow, this actually makes a whole heck of a lot more sense than my ignorant, you know, stuff in my 30s that I wrote that I've spent, you know, so many years now discrediting. But uh, you had to look at it on your own and then, you know, find the community that you want to partake in. And, you know, the interesting thing about the New Testament, it says, when two or more are gathered in my name, we are a church. So right now this is church. You know, yeah, you, don't, you, you don't need the, the building and all of that, you know, and, you know, Holly and I, a few weeks ago, when we were driving up to Northern California or driving back, we were listening to this go guy, Joel uh, Stein. What's, Austin. Joel Austin. Austin. Joel Austin, yeah. right. You know, and this guy really promotes this whole divine grace bit, which again is not part of the teachings of the New Testament. This guy runs these mega churches and stuff, but you know, it's based on this idea that, you know, it's sort of like the chosen people. When you were born, you were already chosen. You can just do whatever you want. You know, Predestination. you don't, right. You don't need you don't need good works. You don't need good behavior. And then that's even been further co-opted. And Holly figured this out recently with the Protestant work ethic. Basically, the Protestant work ethic, your work replaced good deeds, you know. So, you know, they've constantly stretched and taken it away uh, from, you know, the original intent. Well, I mean, at this point, it is like even 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 the occultist are more about doing good works for karma's sake than say evangelical Christians are 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 nowadays. You know, yet some that will be, but a lot of them it's just like, oh well, I'm in grace or whatever. It's like I really don't. I can do what I want. I can screw up. I can I can <laughs> screw you over. I can do whatever, and mm -hmm. I'm still going just because I believe in this particular uh, version of Christianity. And I'm sorry, but that's not. I mean, that's the, that's the big thing is I had the benefit, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'll be honest with everybody. I'm not sure exactly what I believe at this point because of the, the whole Tartary issue and things like that. And I'm, I'm just looking for the truth. Like hopefully everybody else is, maybe some aren't. And I mean, I mean, you know, we've dealt with a lot of those. Ooh, thanks Ruggie. Um, and, um, I'm just looking for the truth. So when I when I talk about this, keep that in mind, people. I'm just another person searching for the truth. Uh, where was I? No, I'm sorry, I lost Well, my... I just wanted to say when Jan and I were listening to Joel Austin on the radio, um, you know, Jan was groaning basically, but we listened to him for like a half hour and he was I saying, you know, that, it doesn't but... matter. Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. It, it was, it, Joel Austin was like, it doesn't matter, you know, what you do. If you fall, you know, grace is waiting for you. And like, he just kept on repeating that, you know, grace is waiting for you no matter what you do in your life. And of course, you know, he's got like a mega church with like, you know, you can hear the crowd in the background. Everyone's like, like everyone right. was cheering, like so excited. And he was the one that, you know, he got criticized like a year or two ago when there were, there was a big flood or a hurricane. Yeah, Harvey. Well, Harvey. we're like, like, why didn't he allow people inside of his church, you know, to protect people during the storm and all this stuff. And he, you know, the guy's a millionaire. He just like brushes everyone off because he's got grace, you know. Well, you know, and, and that whole 
divine grace thing, you know, these guys, you know, it doesn't matter how bad you fall or how much into iniquity you are. He argues, well, that's when God is there to save you. The, the, you know, and this is to me all the spin because you're supposed to be living in truth, doing, you know, on, living honorably and, you know, doing the best that you can to always be a righteous person. That's why it's called the, you know, when something is correct, it's the right. It's your right. It, it, you know, it's righteousness on the right. It's the, the right hand path or on the right hand of God, the right arm of God, the right side of God. The, the Bible repeats these things over and over that truth, honor, righteousness, uh, et cetera, are all tied as part of the right hand path. And then you have the left hand path, which is lies, iniquity, drugs, uh, you know, prostitution, uh, whatever the case may be, that's all on the left-hand path. And then when you wake up to all of this, it's like, you know, and for me, it was using the trivium for eight, nine years and, and following truth and always looking for truth. And then it's like, well, okay, I have to read these things to understand them. And then it became obvious to me that the trivium was how we find truth, whereas the New Testament was how we live in truth. And the Old Testament is like, you, you know, how you're going to fall when you don't live in truth. To me, the Book of Mormon was like, you've fallen, you're a slave now, how the heck are you going to get out? And then the uh, Quran was like, uh, you know, you're you're a slave now, you're in iniquity, if you don't get out soon, we're going to come and wipe you out, you know? <laughs> and so I think yeah. when we talk uh, about rapture... You're cutting out there, Holly. The repeat idea that... that uh, pre repeat that, oh, you cut out. Just yeah, the uh, idea, right, okay. Anything else you have running, make sure it's out? off. You're cutting out. Yeah, go ahead again. Okay, so just quickly, when we talk about rapture, too, like it's, it's twofold and grace along with predestination. So there are people, you know, when you're told with rapture, there's only a certain number of people that are going to make it, and the rest of us are going to have to stick through the thousand years, or they call it, you know, millennialism. Right yeah. now, uh, we have an interesting comment here. It's coming around. It says I was uh, I was always taught that the right hand path is the middle narrow door, the balance. Well, actually, if you read Revelation three fifteen sixteen, he says, uh, I, uh, uh, "I wish thee be hot or cold, or be neither hot. If you're neither hot nor cold, he'll vomit you out or spew you out." And the the right hand path, the straight path, means. Like it's it's true as an arrow. It's straight. It's true. It's an honor. It doesn't mean a middle path as in balance between bad and good. You're supposed to be half bad and half good. You're supposed to live a life of truth and honor. That's part of the trick that you're supposed to figure out regarding the middle path. The middle path it would be like, you know, like we exposed in uh, Kabbalistic inversion, that's that's the trick to get people. That's the transhumanism and the Satanism and all of that stuff that they're selling today that tricks people to not follow truth, but to deny truth, to claim there is no truth and no lie rather than accepting reality is real. Therefore, truth is real. Everything, you know, you know, reality and yeah. logos deals with all that ever was, is or could be. And logos means the word. And if you break it down further, it means reason, and then reason brings you to logic and to truth. And so it's, it's logos is reason, logic, and truth. That is the right-hand path. The middle path is the corruption. It's the moderate that the Bible is very clear is vomit. No, that's, um, a, a, lot of, a lot of that, too, comes out of, there was a, a book circulating around in, um, I believe it was 19, 1981, um, it was some channeled information, and we know about that kind of stuff. Um, it was called the law, of, law, yeah, the law of one, and it was supposed to be by this entity named Ra. And these people were promoting this I idea of a um, that you could uh, you could advance um, spiritually by either being um, uh, in service of self or in service of others and the people that were in service of self they re it really had to be completely bad and the people that were in service of others had to be just a little bit a little bit bad um, but, <laughs> but a little bit more good it was like and this is some of the wacky stuff that that 
that came out. And um, I didn't even know how to fit that one into it because they did the low, they they did like a, a little bit of stuff on on um, uh, the rapture and the antichrist and whatnot like that in that channel channel that so-called channeled information. Um, I um, and that was a very in influential book on the New Age movement in the uh, uh, early '80s and something. I used to have a copy of. And I threw it away. <laughs> it was like a long time, like when I moved well, to Canada. You know, it's like I threw away that book, A Course in Miracles, and years later, it's like, oh, there, that's you know, CIA subproject fifty-eight or whatever under uh, uh, William Thetford and, and these people. It's like oh, I should have kept a copy of it just for that. But oh <laughs> yeah, well. it, it's 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 a philosophy. It, it, like a lot of the a lot of these New Ager books, so he use a. Uh, um, the fallacy of add uh, uh, Jesus Christus, <laughs> you know, appeal to Jesus Christ. <laughs> they do use it all the time. It's like, like um, oh, those people, Abraham Hicks and stuff, the uh, ones that do the secret thing. They're like, well, that's what mm -hmm. Jesus was saying. Mm -hmm. That's what Jesus was saying. And people do that all the time, like in, channel in channeling and stuff like that. And that's something maybe I was going to get into later after. Uh, sure. Uh, after. Well, we'll, let's, we'll let you go on. What slide number are you on now? Um, I'm still uh, with, with Darby. Now, um, the Plymouth Brethren, uh, he, um, John Nelson Darby, he wrote a lot of, uh, he did like a lot of versions of the Bible. I don't really believe that he actually did them all. I think he probably had a team, uh, but he came out of the Plymouth Bre Brethren. He is uh, credited to being the father of uh, dispensationalism and the father of Christian futurism. Can you and give me Christian the actual slide number that you're on, please? Five, five. Thank you five so um anyway he's, he's considered to be the father of christian futurism and uh, that christian futurism where they believe that such books as the apocalypse of john and the book of daniel are about events in the future rather than uh, events taking place um back in those times so um basically what they'll do is they'll hopscotch around uh, you know the gospel of john and the book of daniel and then they'll go into matthew and then they'll go into jeremiah or whatever and pick little pieces out and put them all together and say okay this is what's going to happen in the future and what they came up with was so you go by okay. the, uh okay you, so and then uh, okay. so we actually skipped over some images there that we should have apparently shown oh it's okay. that the um, go field bible right so uh, what, no that you have no, no, uh, you have you have of... images on uh, slides nine, ten, and eleven. Were we supposed to show those? Um, those are just um, proof. Uh, some proof I have that uh, there was no uh, mention the the rapture in my uh, family Bible's dictionary, <laughs> and that was a Bible from 1952 that my parents got up on their wedding, and I just took pictures of. Um, of the dictionary in the back of it, which had all times all types of things explaining different things and concepts uh, having to do with Christianity. There's no mention of the rapture in that Bible and no mention of the tribulation. There is in the concordance of that Bible, there is a mention of the word tribulation, but it's not in reference to the tribulation that Mr. Darby um, was trying try to sell everybody, and I apparently did end up selling everybody. So that's the best way that I thought that I could um, uh, show other than taking out about 300 pamphlets from uh, prior to to the, the 1970s from of uh, Christian things that had nothing to do with the um, with the rapture at all in it, and you know, like I said, my my family was going to a strict evangelical church. It was Free Methodist Church, and then and then we started going to a Nazarene church, and they were just not preaching this whole rapture tribulation thing until the 1970s. wasn't happening. wasn't there. wasn't there. not at all. And that's the only way I could think of, of showing it in a short period of time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So if we can go go back here to um, up to uh, slide fifteen, uh, I guess we're on Oops. slide fifteen. Yeah. So uh, uh, or actually, we'll go to uh, slides uh, sixteen. Sure. So um, uh, so um, 
so Darby, uh, he was a part of this thing called the Plymouth Brethren, and they began in um, Dublin, Ireland, near really conservative, um, maybe like, that's probably a put down by the people of, uh, on Wikipedia or Google or whatever, non, in a non-conformist evangelical offshoot of the Anglican Church. Okay, well, I haven't been able to prove anymore if this is like really like some kind of sty up via the Anglican Church, but it's sure looking like one to me. Um, and so they were also a part of uh, spreading Christian Zionism and uh, that whole idea that um, in order for Jesus to return to earth, that the uh, Jews had to return to Israel. And we all know how that whole thing has turned out for a hell of a lot of people. And uh, then we're going to go to um, slide um, slide 17. And, um, you know, I'm next... gonna, I want to interject there really quick, Mark. Sure, go ahead. Um, the, when the uh, Jews came to the U.S. as the Purim, they were creating a Zion or a new Israel here as well. And we've you know discovered quite a lot of evidence for that. But that plays into the you know, Canaanites and Amalekites and what's discussed in Esther, in the book yes. of Esther in the Old Testament. And then uh, the, you know, of course, we know about the annihilation of the Native Americans that was done under the auspices of that. Yeah, and, and, the, and, the, thing, and the thing is, uh, um, N- Native Americans were a varied, varied group of people. Um, and if you look back at old photographs it just it just trust me on this people look back at old photographs and old drawings of different native american tribes and it was a lot more diverse than than it is now just just do that do that people if you, if you really want to understand what's going on because it the what i what i've gathered on my tartary Tartary research, which is something completely different, is that North America and South America and Africa were a lot more varied, varied in in uh, racial makeup than um, than people are, are are letting on. And after the fall of Tartary, things got a lot a lot more. Uh, segregated I don't know I don't even know how to how to explain it but we can we can deal with that at another time but just people really go and look at the variety of people that were were in the, in the Americas or prior to the pilgrims coming over or whatever you know so um, <laughs> I'm sorry for that tangent but um if we can go here uh, next um, on my list is the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, the Schofield Reference Bible so, um, was made up by this guy, Cyrus I. Schofield. And the thing is, I doubt whether he actually did the whole thing himself. It's probably had a group of people, but you know, he's given credit for doing the whole thing himself. Now, the Schofield Reference Bible also spread this idea of um, Christian futurism and um, uh, dispensationalism as well as Christian Zionism, and they they did this by taking the 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 passage of the, each page in the Bible and placing it in the middle, and then having some stuff about what it meant on top, what it meant on the bottom, what it meant in the middle, and basically putting their spin into it. And this is how the idea of the rapture and uh, the tribulation period and the Antichrist and Christian Zionism was spread to a lot of French churches throughout the um, late 1800s up until when it really caught on in the 1970s. Um, and uh, he, he takes a lot of his stuff from uh, from um, um, from Darby and and in there. And I put um, a uh, a slide up on uh, what is it? Um, uh, 
uh, slide 18 is a picture of the Schofield Bible from, um, and it's uh, the uh, first chapter of John, and which is, they're really trying to, that's where Logos comes into, you know, it's directly mentioned. You sure, know, the that's uh, John 1 through 7 brings in Logos. And um, you can see on there that he's, they're really trying to obscure that whole idea and stuff like that. I mean, there's nothing actually about Logos in there and, and what he's saying. And uh, so it, it's like, if they're really going to have a reference Bible, then, you know what, go and put the eight pages of, uh, of, uh, uh, of translating logos from, from Greek to English. In right. there well, what, what, you know, what I'm going to do is since you brought that up is I'm going to pull that up and, uh, on uh, screen here so that people can see that, uh, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, you know, so what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the King James version with, with uh, Strong's Concordance. So when we go to King James, so it's, uh, oh, I got to put it on uh, Strong's Concordance there. Sorry, folks. And so something said, implication, taught, subject, discourse, reasoning, that is me mental faculty or motive, by extension, computation. So this is all about thinking. This is, you know, well, if you think about it, logos, logos, logic. So question, reasoning, reckon. Okay, so uh, these are all things that deal with finding truth and thinking. It's not just, you know, blindness uh, and, you know, floating up in the sky or whatever. The word was God. What does that mean? I mean, if you don't understand that logos is reason, reason is truth in the word, then you're not going to get the bigger picture of what the New Testament is teaching. And that's probably all done by, you know, intent. And, and that's what I'm that's what I'm thinking, too. I mean, the, the, th the thing is, a lot of these things, you just cannot find the smoking gun or whatever, but you can glean it because it, it's, it's so it's so apparent that this is what they're doing. It's just I, I like feel silly sometimes even like pointing out is like, like, OK, aren't you seeing this, people? Aren't you seeing this? It's just like. This right. is what I'm seeing. Yeah, and, and you, you know, when you use the the trivium and you use the Strong's Concordance when you read the Bible, etc., you know the, what it's talking about is is clear to me. Um, it was, you know, the New Testament is one of the most logical books that I've read. If you understand the parables, and it's constantly repeating, "Live in truth, live in honor, be righteous, live in," tr you know, and it repeats it like several hundred times in four hundred pages, and it's like, do you get it yet? Do you get it yet? Do you get it and, yet? Wait, wait, one more time. Do you get it yet? Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. One more time. Do you get it yet? And so exactly. it goes, you know, and it goes through and it's like constantly explaining it to you. And it's, to me, you know, it's unfathomable that people fall for these Protestant spinoffs that sell divine grace and the rapture and all of this stuff. Because when you get in it and you look at it and you understand it as truth logos reason etc then it just it just makes pure sense yeah and and that and that and that's the whole the, the whole thing is by jumping around in this book in these these books like the gospel of john it can be a singular work onto itself it's there and you can look at it you can look at it and you can read it and you can get this message through that book but when these people jump around and then they they draw okay well this means this from this book of daniel or this means this from the book of revelations or whatever like that they're like going they're they're distorting distorting the things it's just it's a distortion you just need to read the book by itself. What if you were to to read any of these other books I mentioned earlier, like um, Paradise Lost or um, Dante's Inferno, Divine Comedy, and you were to jump around in those books, you could come up with any number, uh, any number of um, of um, of um, uh, theories or or uh, side stories from any of these books, and. It, these people are doing a disservice 
to to everybody by just jumping around and saying, okay, this is here and this is there and that. But this is how I figured out what, you know, how I figured out what they were doing. And I figured this out quite some time ago. I just haven't, I'm, I'm, I'm a shy person. So I, and I get tongue tied and things like that. So I just haven't, you know, put it out as much until, until you asked me to come on the show and, and talk <laughs> about this. And I'm glad you did. Um, but um, um, and what happened, you know, if they're thinking like this, then, okay, this is their method. So this is what, how I'm coming up with what I'm coming up with is how they're using all these disparate things to sell this whole story, which I think is trying to lead to a one world government and one world religion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, you know, and then, you know, exactly true. And then not only that, we constantly see that it's a corruption of truth, honor, logic, uh, you know, these tenets. And so if it's always taking away from that, you know, like this divine grace stuff and all of the antinomianism, which means against mm -hmm. the law or against natural law, like, yeah. you know, all of these things take away from what Christianity was. And then everybody points at these straw man arguments and say, ha, 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 your Christianity yeah. is nonsense. And none of them <clears throat> pick up the, you know, the Bible for themselves and sit down and read the thing, you know, and it's like, okay. So it's, it's, it's really key for people to do that on their own and not sit here and listen to what we have to tell you about. I mean, you know, obviously we want you to listen to and support the show, but we're telling you, to get out there and read it and study it for yourself, not take Mark Holly and Jan's opinion on it solely. Get in there and read it for yourself. I know people out there who only want people say to, you know, read just the King James Bible. Oh, you can't read anything else. It's a simulacrum or whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, so therefore there's no missing books and this sort of stuff. But, well, how come if there's no missing books, we have the apocryphal text? Well, that means hidden. Right. And then we have the book of Jasher, which is mentioned three times in the Bible. Well, that's not in there. So right there, we know there's 13 missing books. And so they're going to, you know, so even if we say, OK, the Apocrypha wasn't in there, even though it was, uh, if even if we just go by the book of Jasher, then we know at least one book is missing. So you have to admit if the book of Jasher is discussed three times, it's missing. And when you go in and you read these books, they give so much more context, and then you start realizing, well, hey, wait a second, these books explain everything. Maybe that's why they were taken out. And then after the book of Jasher, <clears throat> there's 12 other books that were missing, but like the Catholic Bible and some of the, the Bibles, they'll, you know, like the King James 1611, they'll throw the Apocrypha back in, but it's just thrown in at the end of the Old Testament. This is a uh, Orthodox study Bible. But the Orthodox study Bible actually at least puts the uh missing text back in and it's got a really interesting thing here where it shows you and if, if i can find it here quickly it shows you a comparison of the different bibles there and the the catholic one being in the middle uh this this one here being protestant and then this one near the center of the of the seam here is the orthodox and we can see you know each has you know, as we, we go into the Orthodox, it has far more material. So, you know, when people are telling us, oh, you know, it's a simulacrum, we shouldn't study any of these other texts, we should, you know, close our eyes to anything they have to say, and we should focus on ignorance and not knowing what we have to say. Well, I have to take issue with that. You know, anyway, sorry, go ahead. That's a little bit of a segue. Yeah, it's, it's, it's no problem. No problem. Yet. I also have to uh, point out, too, that um, the placement of Daniel in the Orthodox Bible is different than it is. in Correct. The it, it's, it actually right. takes the place like the a revelation for the Old Testament, which is the last book of the Old Testament. They moved right. it back 12 spaces. And it's a very important point. It's a very important point. And also it uh, has, um, oh, what was it? Suzanne, Suzanne in it. And, and, that, and, and the bell, the dragon. Yeah. Yeah. And things that, things that aren't in the, um, aren't in the other, there, other. There's one, the wisdom of Sirach, huh? Wait, what is yeah. it? Wait, wait, huh? Yeah. Wasn't, wasn't, it's not in, it's not in the Protestant Bibles. And, you know, if we look at King James, I mean, 
King King James. Uh, I mean, just look at King James and look at the and look at the list of people and what they did who translated who did the translation for him. The only importance of the King James Bible, in my opinion, is that most of uh, the the laws in uh, the U.S. and uh, uh, countries of um, the British Commonwealth are based on on that. So maybe that's a good reason for understanding it. But if you want to understand what's in the actual Bible, you probably you're probably better off. Uh, to go with the English version of the Orthodox Bible. And just I, I would agree with you, you know, and I hear, I constantly hear, you know, people out there proselytizing and saying, hey, you shouldn't read these other books. You shouldn't read, say, the Quran or any of these other books that are right hand path. You know, you should only read the King James Version. To me, that's a limited hangout, especially when they say that. You know, that uh, you shouldn't accept any flattering titles in this sort of thing because, you know, being a Christian means you accept the title of being a Christian and it means that you might get killed for it because when you understand Logos and truth and living in honor all the time, the deceivers out there, they don't want people living in truth and honor. That's the big thing. So, you know, and then you realize this and it's like, wait a second, why are you trying to limit? Why are you trying to make me more ignorant rather than more knowledgeable why why would it why would it hurt me to read the orthodox the king james you know i have the uh, the polyglot bible upstairs and i i wonder you know from the polyglot bible it takes the old testament it breaks it down i should have brought that one downstairs but it takes it down and it breaks it the old testament and, and it ties it to the greek in the strong's concordance rather than the hebrew yeah exactly and and that and that's a, that's an important point too um, personally, I think I'm one of the people that believes that the Old Testament was written after the New Testament. I believe I, I'm that, in that camp with you, and that's you know people scream uh, at the, at me for that all the time. I'm a, I I believe, um, and I'm a lot of it is because of the stuff I've read on Fomenko and things that he's he's brought up and. Uh, that would it would take us a long time, but he brought up um, a lot of points where the New Testament and the Quran were sort of blended in uh, Tartaria. So I, I, we can go into that another time if you'd like. I'm still still looking into it myself. So, but we can go if we can just go on here like a little bit. Sure. And um, what slide are we get on? Back, Sorry, we're going to get back to. Uh, uh, on page 19. Now, um, we've discussed that um, John Darby came from the uh, Plymouth Brethren. Also coming out of the Plymouth Brethren was our old buddy, Alistair Crowley. <laughs> and he was, he was born to wealthy members of the Plymouth Brethren. But he separated from uh, that belief system to explore the occult and you know the rest is history. We we've <laughs> we've dealt with him a lot. However, one thing I want to make a point of is that in 1904, Crowley claimed that he took to dictation from an entity named Awas, uh, which resulted in the Book of the Law. And this work described the new eon of Horus, uh, new eon controlled by the god Horus. Now. Um, Basically, you know, I've read this. I I started exploring all these things when I was when I was younger, trying to look for an alternative to Christianity because of what the Rapture people did to my family's church. Um, so I've read all of Crowley and all this stuff like that, and basically. The book of the law is a sort of a left behind thing for people that would rather live in a world uh, uh, devoid of Christians. <laughs> and basically, that's basically that's what Satanists, it is. you know, basically people that don't want other people thinking and catching you in a lie. So they promote all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody's in the chat group right now arguing that it's mushrooms. We've already covered that it's logos, that it's about truth and honor. 
but they're bringing up these left-hand path tactics, which I fell for in my youth. And, you know, so let's get it back on to truth, honor, logos, yeah. integrity. Yeah. You know, it's like, you can argue that Jan and I both know all, all that stuff. You know, we both try to cleanse our pineal gland, <laughs> do all like our, our chakra stuff and all that stuff like that. We've, all, we've, we've been through it. So, you know, you ain't going to proselytize us into that. <laughs> you just not, it's not going to happen. So just give it up. <laughs> um, so anyway, Crowley does this work. And, um, you know, it, you know, takes some time to catch on and it doesn't really start catching on until the sixties and, you know, young, uh, you know, as well as other people have done like a lot of, a lot of work on, on exposing, um, the people of the counterculture like Timothy Leary and Terrence McKenna and stuff for make, making all this stuff, um, more, uh, mainstream in society. How, and that brings us to the next slide, which is um, another linkage to Crowley. However, um, and Holly had brought up uh, about um, um, this character, H.P. Lovecraft. Now, he began writing these uh, pulp fiction uh, novels in, um, you know, around 1908, getting them published in magazines and stuff like that. They were about these strange alien gods or these older gods and um, um, things uh, like like that. Uh, like one, the character of Cthulhu, who kind of is crossed between a, a mushroom cloud and an octopus and a harpy or whatever like that. Um, so, and that'll play into to some point other that Cthulhu looks like a mushroom cloud, you know, like the nuclear deal. Now, um, now, um, Lovecraft's work sort of mirrored some of the things in the works of Crowley and um, other um, occultists like uh, Jack Parsons and uh, you know, the dude that uh, started up uh, Scientology of Ron o. Hubbard and things like that. But um, people started noticing the similarities between the things in H.P. Lovecraft's novels and um, the work of Crowley um specifically now and um uh, 1972 which is an, a, kind of a trigger year as this discussion goes on as you'll find out later uh a, a man named kenneth grant who was a former i believe former secretary of uh, crowley started writing the typhonian trilogies and these books started to merge uh, crowley's magical system with uh, lovecraft's fiction now as we progress over over the time period through uh, a mainstream pop culture, the whole Lovecraftian ethos and the magic, the Typhonian magic that's uh, uh, stemmed from it uh, will start merging with rapture doctrine. But I put this here just because, well, that's where Lovecraft was on the timeline. And another person I put in here is um, Edgar Casey, the sleeping prophet. Um, just because of the timeline, his stuff will start merging with the rapture doctrine later on as well, um, even though he really doesn't say anything about it, but all of his talks about uh, his Atlantis and stuff like this somehow become confused in people's minds as being a part of what's going to happen in the future, sort of a, a new age version of dispensationalism. So um, we're going to skip up to uh, 19... Um, 59 to um, and Vatican II. And Holly, thanks for bringing this up the other day when, when all of us talked on the phone. Um, because, um, I, you know, I had completely ignored this because, well, for one thing, I, um, I went to an evangelical church and not a Catholic church. But um, at that point in Vatican II, one of the changes was um, uh, more embracing of uh, charismata or spiritual gifts in which um, it was saying that it was okay for people in contemporary times to uh, experience like a, a spiritual gifts uh, uh, maybe like things like um, having visions uh, speaking in tongues laying on the hands healing and type of like that and if they were going to allow it and not um, 
I mean, I should always say it was some kind of demonic possession or something like that. Now, this happened right along and coincided with the beginning of the charismatic movement. Now, the charismatic movement is um, supposed to have been started around 1960 in Protestant churches, and it stems more so, is stemming more so out of Pentecostalism and stuff like that, but it is based on the Greek idea of charismata and the spiritual gifts, and it's, you know, like I said, it's uh, in the belief that people in uh, in uh, contemporary times are able to display such uh, gifts as speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, visionary dreams, laying in of hands for healing, prophecy, you know, different types of miracles and stuff like that. Now, the, the thing is with, with this whole charismatic movement, depending on what church you went to, if you went to the Pentecostal churches, okay, people would be doing, it was more of an in, um, um, emphasis on speaking in tongues, whereas the churches that I personally went to as I was younger, um, the Free Methodist and the um, uh, Nazarene Church, um, and they wouldn't quite go there with the speaking in tongues thing. They thought that that was more like a like a demonic in origin and um, and not actually a work of the spirit. Where they and then the people in the the Pentecostal churches would say, well, if you don't if you don't believe that our speaking in tongues is real, then you're being a follower of Satan and stuff like that, or blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And there was like a lot of back and forth. It was like, okay, okay. Um, it's, it's like, oh, no, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. No, you're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. It was like, it was just got really childish, childish between these denominations there for a while. And, but the thing is, it's like, you know, I've been around people speaking in tongues in some of these churches and stuff like that. And the pastors at least would make an attempt to, um, to uh, speak in uh, little bits of Greek, Latin, and uh, Hebrew, whereas some of the members of the congregation that weren't too bright would just uh, do like a lot of gibberish. So it's like, I'm really not believing a lot of them were actually speaking in tongues. I just want to... Were- Jump in there really quick and say thanks to Sean and I belong in the kitchen for forty and five dollar donations. Thank you so much. Good job, guys. <laughs> and so that was basically what was you know was happening with this is charismatic movement just started taking over over all the Christian denominations except for orthodoxy and um, more uh, fundamental Mormon churches. Um, I think it seeped into the main Mormon church a little bit, but um, it basically took over all of Protestantism um, as the uh, 60s progressed and into the 70s and uh, started infiltrating the Catholic church in the late 60s. And it still has created quite a bit of a schism um, in the Catholic in the Catholic church and still hasn't taken over um taken over uh, orthodoxy, although there are some things similar going on in Russia as far as weird prophets and stuff like that, but we'll save that for, for another time, um, uh, just because uh, there, there will be a show on to themselves, and hopefully I can get some more stuff done for that for you guys at a later time. Now, um, it's um, this also... I'm going to point out just because you guys have been doing a, a lot of, of work concerning um, uh, use of vaccines and the spread, you know, and um, of course Jan's work uh, um, exposing psychedelics and things like that. Now, the charismatic movement coincides with the increase of the use of vaccines. Like right around 1960, we started started getting more and more vaccines. I know when I was small, there was, what was, was it, um, polio, smallpox, and uh, tuberculosis. And my parents did not have, they had me get the polio one, but did not have me get the tuberculosis one or the smallpox one because there was a lot of um, problems with those particular vaccines at that time. But then as... Um, I got a little bit older, maybe like just around uh, 1970, they started coming in with the measles and rubella vaccines and things like that. So we have to, we can't ignore the fact that these things 
were coinciding with the uh, rise of the charismatic movement. And now, especially the psychedelic drugs part, a lot of the, the people we started getting into our church when I was younger, uh, we started getting some ex hippies in that <laughs> basically came to came to God because they started having hallucinations of demons chasing them and things like that. And well, you know, even if they weren't on psychedelics at the time, you get flashbacks, folks. If it's in your system, it happens again. <laughs> and if you're listening out there, Fred, I love you, brother. And he, <laughs> I love you. But seriously, you're a great guy. But you you um the I, audience I is saying you're a bit hard to hear, Mark, if you could speak uh, up. Okay, okay. Um you know, I, I just I, I just sent out a personal message, but anyway, love you, <laughs> love you. But um, it, it, that was one is he had like some very weird experiences, and they, he his conversion actually uh, came, admittedly, um, via uh, a bad trip on acid. <laughs> so, and, That's scary, though. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, you know, I did enough of that crap in my day. And then you wake up and you realize what it's all about and you start living in truth, you know, and you start seeing all of this stuff and how they're promoting it and how, you know, that's a false spirituality rather than living in truth. You're chasing after a drug high and, you know, seeing stuff on these drugs. So then when you, you know, get right with yourself, you know, and, and to me, there's two separate falls. There's the individual fall and then there's the society fall. You know, yeah, so, you know, you, you have your own thing that you go through, but society as a whole falls as well. You know, so the CIA, Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, you know, Tim Leary, Terrence McKenna, they're promoting the the social fall. And then you have your own trials and tribulations to go through to get to truth on your own as well. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we're just going to um, go ahead and skip up here to uh, 1970. And in 1970, Mr. Hal Lindsey, along with his friend Carol C. Carlson, released this book called The Late Great Planet Earth. And basically, it was a long diatribe on dispensationalism, Christian futurism, and Christian Zionism. And Christianity changed forever as a result of the, this book coming out. And he hopscotched all throughout the Bible, putting these things together, blah, 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 blah. Here we go. Here we go. It's like, okay, now if you look in Daniel here, and then you look in Revelation here, and then you go to Jeremiah here, and then you go here and here and here, uh, uh, it tells you that one day all the Christians are going to disappear and then people are going to say oh goody the Christians are gone and then the ones that are like okay well I thought I was a Christian um, are going to be saying where did my friends go oh they must have believed her in me so now I gotta I gotta stay here and not get my head stamped with 666 so that um, so that I can go to heaven and be with them after Jesus comes and defeats the Antichrist. And so this is what this is what happened. You know, it's, it's like this book comes out and then it's like he does this with all this a lot of geopolitical um, um stuff and he brings in and says okay the european union is the beast in revelations and d does that based on how many countries were in the european union at that time and which has changed and then he goes on about like how whoa it's been it's the israel 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 was founded in 1948 so i guess the rapture i'm betting the rapture is going to happen and um 1988, because it's Check. 40 years after the rapture. Check this uh, out. Yeah. The uh, CIA's MK Ultra program was launched on May 13, 1947. I think it was, was it May 13, 1948 or 1947 that Israel was founded? But they're founded on the same yeah. day, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Yeah, it, it, I don't think it is. I don't think it is either. And, you know, 
the thing is, I'm cool with the rank and file um, Jewish person. You know, I don't think that every single Jewish person out there is involved with with this. Uh, you know, with any Kabbalah. Yeah, sure. A lot of, you know, and we have friends that, you know, have come to us just in the last year saying, hey, wow, we see it now, you know. Yeah. And so it's just like, you know, but I actually think, I I, I personally think um, that uh, it's it's a, a using of this particular people to as a hammer i don't even know how to describe it we can go into that some other time but anyway so this book for really flame the uh, if and the flames of christian zionism and uh yeah people like going oh god we gotta protect israel now and no matter what they do and it was released along the same just right after um the uh, six day war so Maybe I don't think that's any coincidence either. Well, you know, and then uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were taken away from King Hussein and John Allegro during the Six Day War as well. But, you know, we're looking more and more that that whole thing is probably a fraud or a fake as well. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking, too. And I'm thinking I'm thinking actually it's a part of of this this whole psyop. Right. Well, you know, because when you realize Tartary in the whole picture and that all of this was contemporary across this massive empire that spanned most of the northern hemisphere then you see this these documents showing up in 1947 right at the you know that just happened to give the founding of israel legitimacy right yeah and, exactly. so then, and then you have to start questioning it from this whole other level but you know when you realize the house of israel is the 12 tribes and the 12 tribes was this huge you know the largest empire the world has ever seen and that it was based on logos and truth and honor and that's how it spread so fast and so far then you start seeing all this stuff and then it makes you you know forces you to question the dead sea scrolls veracity as to studying you know fomenko who you know for those that are intelligent enough to read them i get you know attacks uh, even for presenting fomenko they'll bring up uh uh Mazarov or one of these guys and use a guilt by association fallacy and say you know bring up one quote and say well see therefore I debunked all of the hundred books that Fomenko ever wrote, ever wrote and all of his citations and everything it's just the most idiotic arguments you can possibly imagine against the guy okay anybody anybody wants to debunk Fomenko like you know what go read all his stuff I have you read it come back to me it'll take you a while <laughs> well, you know most, most you know the i've read you know almost two of his books and these are you know one of them you know chronology one is about seven eight hundred pages it's a good thick read and uh you know you start out you know with the you know this is bs and by the time you're like on page 60 it's like okay and then you get to 150 and you're like well, by gosh, I might have to rethink some of my beliefs. And then you get to the end of the book and you're just, you know, his argument is so sound just in book one. You know, and that's, you know, without going on through the whole chronology series and then the other 30 books that are translated in English and all of this stuff, you know. Yeah, and this might be a tangent, but I'm just going to step away from the thing here and get something. And we're just going to sell something like once and for all with people because I got some physical evidence on my hand and I'll just show them about Tartary. <laughs> okay. Sure. Um, Jan, have you shown the audience all the books, the late great planet Earth, like slide 29, 30, 31? I did show a couple of them. 29 is on screen and okay. here's the new world coming. Uh, 31, there's a new world coming, you know, and this is all from Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, the, the new world. And, you you know, you'll w- be watching movies and stuff, and they always have to throw that nonsense in. So, and here here we go. Here's a, here's a, a Tartaria. It's from a, this uh, is a page from a book from 1601, 1635, Tartaria, going way down into Hold India. it up a little bit more. Up, yeah, there you go. And this 1635, you see Tartaria going all the way down into India. That's most of India. <laughs> yeah, most of India. And this is this is Tartaria, and it's going on to the Americas. 1601. This this is a page from Brooklyn. 1601. Hold, hold it up so we can see it. Yeah. 
And you know, this is not stuff I got off the internet. It's in my it's in my hands right now. <laughs> so there you go. It's like debunk the make all you want. <laughs> it's like there was actually a place called Tariri. It wasn't just no man's land. It was a real country. And I have I have more stuff. And a very, very, very large country at that. You know, and it's like, how does every history book that I've ever read up until you know, discovering this stuff, just omit Tartary. You know, how do you omit the largest empire on earth that spanned most of the Northern Hemisphere, including the Americas? How does that happen, you know? And, you know, it's like, I, I see this as a part of this discussion because 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 all this whole rapture thing and stuff like this is just to keep us away from, like, is another thing that keeps us away from knowing where these things actually came from. From learning our true heritage, really. Yeah. And, and here's something I want to point out, too. One of the symbols of Tartary was the owl. What have they done with that owl now? They've turned it into this symbol for the Illuminati or whatever like that, or Moloch um, what's and what's a Bohemian Grove and stuff like that. But it was the flags of Tartary had the griffin and owl, owls on them. And now they've been um, bastard, bastardized by these Illuminati people and stuff like that. Are, are you guys hearing me okay? Is my yeah, you can speak up a little bit. Also, you know, to the audience, uh, please support the show. We're going to go on a little bit longer here. He's got, you know, quite a lot more, but uh, we can definitely use all the support from the audience we can get. Thank you, those who uh, have supported already. Uh, I Belong in the Kitchen and Sean, uh, I think, uh, and uh, Rugi were who donated so far. Thanks so much for all that. So um, we'll go on here. Um, and uh, um, with the late great planet Earth, um, um, like I said he, he uh, basically is the guy that came up with the rapture doctrine uh, or, or promoted the rapture doctrine in the 70s in the early part of the 70s now um, at the same time in the same year a novel or two novels were released by a guy named Salem Kirban and uh, maybe uh, <laughs> there's a link there to Salem but we don't know but it's kind of kind of odd <laughs> But um, mm. these uh, novels were 666 and um, 1000. Now 666, the novel 666 dealt with um, uh, what would happen after the rapture in the seven-year seven tribulation period um, under the rule of the Antichrist. Now the novel 1000 dealt with the events that would happen after Jesus defeats the Antichrist and rules the earth for a thousand years. Now, I hope that people can see what, why this rapture deal that they're preaching is kind of a problem with uh, all this the globalists and stuff like that. So, um, you know, um, excuse me just a minute. Um, just trying to compose my thoughts together. Um, so basically... Here's something that could be manufactured in some way or another, or people could be led to think that they're under the control of, say, um, a, a character like Antichrist and, you know, start like doing microchipping or whatever like that. And then another ruler comes along a little bit later and says, okay, I'm defeating this guy, but actually that person is just... Uh, one of these globalists saying, okay, we got this, we have the world all together under Christ now. <laughs> do, you, do you see where I'm going with this? Like this would be a way of putting in um, a, uh, well, basically taking a, a whole like Orwellian big brother society, putting it there for seven years worldwide, then shoving in the, Hulksley brave new world thing as a replacement for the society and then people would be stuck in this uh this trap thinking that okay um well they're living under christ uh but they're actually living under this false this false uh, uh fabricated fabricated thing so this is my problem with the whole rapture doctrine is it's got people thinking that okay some people are going to go away and then there's going to be a an Antichrist that's going to start imprinting people or microchipping them or whatever, 
then he's going to be defeated in seven years, which is relatively a short period of time. And then Jesus is going to take over the world at that time. But I'm thinking, well, if that happens, it's probably going to be a fake Jesus. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's a couple of different ways you have to think about it. There's always the blood of the lamb issue, which <laughs> would be a whole show or series unto yeah. its own. And then, uh, you know, with you, it could also be, you know, Logos, people waking up to Logos, to truth, to Jesus incarnate and, you know, doing it that way. But I see it, you know, from my own personal perspective, it's, you know, people waking up to truth and reason again and waking up and realizing, you know, all of this left hand b uh, left hand path bs is all a trick and a scam you know and yeah. you know but you know the thing is is enough people right now aren't reading the new testament for themselves to be able to see all this stuff going on but what's interesting is you know for the last year i've been noticing quite a number of people suddenly uh becoming christians yeah, and so that's this is what I've, you know, come to a point with with this is. And and by the way, all, sorry. Thank you in common for the five dollars there. This is. What I'm thinking is like, we definitely have to change things, but as we've seen in the past, these people who are controlling the world are kind of smarter than the rest of us. And people are just well, waking up. I'm not really here's, smarter. Here's the thing. They're not really smarter. And that's what they want you to believe. That's what Jordan Peterson and these people all sell off of them faking their Harvard entrance exams and this kind of stuff. But yeah, exactly. they're, they're, they're good at sophistry. They're good at lying. It's like, okay, you know, they're the kids that run around the beach and kick over the sandcastles and they think they're talented. You know, and that's yeah. what it really comes down to. But it, when people begin to use the trivium and begin asking who, what, where, when, why, and how, and fact-checking for themselves, then they quickly get on this, this same level, and then they can begin to see this stuff. But the issue is, is most people just believe what other people tell them rather than reading it for themselves. It's like, you know, every time someone tells you, you know, when I read the New Testament for myself and you know, I realized then that every single thing that anybody had ever told me about it was a lie. And that's, you know, really mind blowing. Somebody just mentioned Joseph Campbell in the chat and uh, Joseph Campbell was a huge fraud involved in all this stuff, was a big Crowleyite, etc. And, uh, you know, uh, involved in the uh, Maverick Society, which was not far from where, again, Alistair Crowley has to come up. Do we ever do a show where his name doesn't come up? My goodness, you know. I don't think so because the, the the thing the thing is, you know, at one time in my life I was, you know, into into his work, but I mean, I just I found some of the things that he would call for people to do kind of repugnant. So that saved me from getting too far into it. <laughs> and I mean, that's that's basically I just. I don't know how to, I don't really want to go into yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, you know, left-hand <laughs> path, that's all you need to say, you know, it's just yeah. disgusting. Yeah, so um, anyway, it's like, that's why I brought him into this, is because the thing is, he, he's from Plymouth Brethren, and then the Plymouth Brethren come up with this rapture thing, but even though he says he's not with the Plymouth brother anymore, he basically came came up with a book that's like the the left hand path side of the rapture. <laughs> it's like all I can you know. I mean, that's all I can say about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, so so just to think about that, you know, when uh, you know I had been raised going to Catholic church, so I didn't really hear about the rapture mu much, you know, I'd hear a little bit about revelation here and there, but I had friends who were, um, you know, Jehovah's witness or other sort of more recent, uh, Protestant branches or evangelical. And they would talk about the rapture quite a bit. And it was only a certain number of people and they were already chosen. So what is everyone else supposed to do? And I think at that point, you know, talking about Crowley and other people, it's like, 
okay, we'll just do whatever because the people have already been chosen. So there's nothing you can do about it. You can't clean up your act. You can't, you know, it's either God chooses you or he doesn't. So that that's yeah. where I think people, will get that idea that they don't need to take responsibility for themselves it, it, it creates it creates a sense of hopelessness in people so then of course they're going to like you know switch you know to to um uh, you know living in drugs living in promiscuity um living in you know hate anger you know killing thievery whatnot but um we can skip uh, over here to um, what real the the pivotal thing. Although these two books came out, let's face it, a lot of people don't read. <laughs> you know, a lot of Christians <laughs> don't read. They'll go to church. They'll go to church. If you want to hide something, you put it in a book, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but you want. But if you want something, if you want something to be seen by people, you put it in a movie. Because everybody. Well, no, likes now it's a, a, a one and a half minute YouTube video clip because that's the, the attention span now. It's like a goldfish, you know? Yeah. And well, and that comes to a point I'm going to bring up later with the names of these apocalypse movies, how they, they sort of degraded over the years. Now, in 1972, we have an independently produced and independently produced is in question marks um, A Thief in a Night. And this was a rapture film, and it was distributed to churches. And you notice the name, A Thief in the Night. It's, you know, it's coming from the Bible. It's like, you know, the Son of Man will come like a thief in the night. And it's got a little bit more uh, 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 mental mental uh, facilitation behind it than later rapture movies that we'll see later. Uh, in the title of the uh, title of it. Now, this movie was distributed to churches, and it came to uh, not my specific church, but uh, a sister church of the one I was going to at the time. And basically, this movie was about a, a, a twenty-something. Can you, 19- can you let, sorry? Can you let me know which slide you're on so I can show? Or- I'm on. Um, okay. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, here the, I found it. It's uh, 38, it looks like. Yeah, 38. That'll be a picture of the... Uh, sure, of the, thanks. Uh, That's what I wanted to show for the audience yeah. there. So this, in A Thief in the Night, this uh, uh, girl who considered herself a Christian, I'm, her name is Pat, Patty in, in the film, she um, goes to a church and she reads the Bible and goes to a church she considers herself a Christian, but she just hasn't quite uh, accepted it in a hardcore way. And her pastor, I guess, hasn't either. So in this movie, she wakes up in the morning and hears that all these people start disappearing. And then she can't find her husband and she can't find her mom and she can't find her sister and they've all been raptured away. The only one that she knows that hasn't been raptured away is her pastor. So both of them are like, well, crap, we didn't get raptured away. So we got to sit here and wait uh, um, and not get our head stamped because uh, we don't want to go to hell. So basically the rest of the movie is about her having flashbacks to stuff and about her husband getting bit by a cobra, which is kind of weird, but that's in there. And, um, 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 she, excuse me. Um, and, um, then her and her pastor trying to escape, not getting stamped. Now I'm seeing this at 11 years old (laughs) and I'd never heard any of this before. My mom, my grandma, my dad, they've been, you know, read me the Bible and stuff since since I've been born, and never anything came up about this whole rapture, antichrist kind of thing at all. And apparently, the same thing was for a lot of people at the, at that church that night. And so they're seeing this movie. There's like little kids getting their heads stamped with the mark of the beast. And then the pastor, he ends up getting his head cut off and because he don't take the mark of the beast. And then 
Patty, she's running away from her, from her neighbor who, who is one of the people going around stamping people with the mark of the beast. And then there's this guy that's supposed to be a beast and he's some old dude in there and he's telling everybody, unite, unite, unite. And, and it's like, if you don't unite and don't get your head stamped, then you're not a proper uh, citizen and, and all that stuff like that. And then she finds out it, it's all just a bloody dream. But then the alarm clock goes off and they start talking about how people are disappearing again. So uh, so then after this, and then the song by um, Christian, um, a Christian um, rock artist uh, at the time, he's like one of the Jesus people, um, one of the people from that Jesus people movement. I think, I think you've talked about them before, exposed them before. Anyway, um, he starts singing this song of, oh, I wish we'd all been ready and stuff. And it quotes a few Bible verses and this goes on slow and says, I wish we'd all been ready and all this stuff like that. And two girls are in the field, one's taken, the other left, uh, like all this stuff like that. And people are freaking out in the church and they're crying and they're bawling. They're going, they're going up to the altar and all these people are getting saved. So, of course, like everybody, at the you know, the past the people in the church at that that particular church they're like well this is cool this film's like getting people saved and stuff like that and uh so after that all these churches the churches i was going to started promoting all the stuff from hal Lindsay and this book and stuff like that now i talked to my mom about it and she's like well um it's kind of this kind of stuff kind of freaks me out and uh our pastor Wormuth, he thinks he thinks this whole charismatic movement and these things are actually and uh, the people promoting this stuff are actually um, actually um, a part of uh, the Antichrist or whatever like that. So this pa this pastor he um, completely left that church because everybody got into promoting this sort of a uh, Christian Zionism and charismatic charismatic movement and uh, yeah, well, isn't Christian it, Zionism a whole subject unto yeah. its own? Yeah. And he just he just didn't want to be a part of it, so he went to an even a more rural church than the one we were at at the time, um, um, and a farming community that you know there were farmers, and they just he he just couldn't deal with what was a lot of basically young Christians coming in, uh, taking over the church, uh, putting this charismatic uh, stuff in there, and uh, preaching all this apocalypse doomsday cult stuff and basically basically what was happening with these people is they were just being scared and being selfish that they would go to hell or have to endure these tortures of the antichrist so they were accepting jesus uh based on a fear that they were going to be tortured by the right. antichrist Ra rather than rather than you know accepting logos and truth and living in honor and truth and reason they fall prey to this fear promotion which is again a, a pseudo christianity it's you know like you said a minute ago it's basically this antichrist movement so i wanted to say thanks to innovative solutions for donating uh, 20 dollars just now and thanks to kate for sending 9.99 we really appreciate it of course we are a listener sponsor we're up to like 105 for the night so thank you you know, folks, for supporting the show, we need all the help we can get. Holly and I, you know, as you can see, the stack of books there, and we've been, you know, trying to cover all we can on Salem and the Puritans and all of that, and that's such a, a rabbit hole. It's unbelievable. So all this help and support we can get, we really appreciate it. So that's, that's good. Thanks, thanks, guys, for donating that because uh, these guys are exposing some things that need to be exposed, and you, and. Uh, you know, the thing I've noticed about Jan after um, viewing his show over the years is he changes as new information is presented. And a lot of people, you can't say that a lot about a lot of a lot of the people in the alternative media. They're sticking to their guns, even if they're presented with the information that they're not right. And yeah, you know, and that's that's just the thing is I try to follow truth. You know, I started out when I launched the show. It's been uh, 10 years and a couple of months, and I started the show a total liberal believing in psychedelic spirituality. And here we're talking about logos and living in truth and honor, uh, you know, so it's been a, a long time. Uh, we do have somebody's asking. There are some shows that uh, had to be 
or that are off the the site there were some issues so uh that's it for now uh hopefully we'll be able to get a backup up sooner or later but uh for now you'll have to forget about them so we'll take care of it when we can mm -hmm. Okay, so sorry, which slide are we on now? Um, I'm, it, I'm just uh, checking where I've where I've where I'm at now. Um, I'm kind of. Was it okay, uh, slide um, thirty nine, distant thunder? Or did we get past that? Okay, the, those movies are those movies. There um, are all the the sequels to um, to um, a thief in a night. There's a distant thunder. Uh, image, image of the beast, and prodigal planet. They did four movies in total. Now um, they're all. The first two deal with um, this girl, this girl Patty. Um, uh, the the second one, the distant thunder, is her and two other girls are hiding out from uh, trying not to get um, their not to get involved with the beast and they're hiding out and then they go to a concentration camp and not like that the next the next uh film is uh another variation on that but without the the, the character of patty in it and the last one is um uh, uh having to do with the battle in armageddon or megiddo and over in the middle east um so those those films, um, you know, they're 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 Christian kitsch uh, uh, films or Christian. Or, I, I you know, Can you pull those up, Jan. Just show them. I, yeah, I just I just showed them a minute ago. I'll show them again here. So. I mean, people people are watching them for for uh, com comedy now, and although churches still till still um, still trundle them out to um, to try to get people. Say, but they're so predictably seventies um, apocalyptic. People say you can find them on YouTube, even. Yeah, yes, you can find them on YouTube. They're 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 there, <laughs> and and common conspiracies. They're probably really really bad. Yeah, probably so. <laughs> I belong in the kitchen says, I love Jan's attitude when his wife is on with him. He's much happier and more pleasant. It's a great combo. Thanks for that. That's really nice. Yeah. Congr congrats on your marriage, marriage guys. It's, it's, it's a good thing to, to have, have a, a, a partner with you. It really is. It Especially really to talk, talk about weird stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you know, because like, <laughs> she's the only person that even understands me until we unravel it all and then try to explain it to the public. So, you know, it's, it's nice that, uh, she uh, actually understands the 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 crazy paths I go down. Most so, people think we're crazy. So, <laughs> um, hopefully, we can just stay on a little bit longer so that I can just uh, deal with uh, the the seventy the rest of the seventies and into the eighties, and then we can just maybe cut it there. Cool. Uh, sure. So uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, chick tracks. Now uh, these uh, chick tracks. Um, and they, they sort of gained a, another kitsch collector's name right now. There's these little tracks in their um, conservative uh, Christian point of view, evangelical. Um, there's a lot of anti-Catholic, anti-Mormon things in chick tracks. Um, and there, um, then, but there's also like a lot of anti-New Age thing in chick, chick, chick tracks too. But they also very, they're very much they're like little comic books, and uh, they're kind of hilarious. But they have ones like the Last Generation and the Mark of the Beast and things like that. Now, the Last Generation is going how like the Antichrist and stuff like that is going to preach the whole New Age movement to the youth in schools, and it's a thing of like p pitting. Um, pitting the youth against uh, against the, the, the old people and um they um they they'll have they'll have like um like all these like little comic books and there's a oh, here we go um on uh, slide 43 um if i turn in a sicko will i will i get a reward yes a big reward just give me your teacher's names and we will uh treat their treat their illness and stuff like that now um the thing is what's really funny is um 
some of the images and the the chick tracks where um i'm showing um, on them on screen right now so you can yeah. if you want to keep going they, where they have like people people uh these little kids turning in their parents sort of remind me of some of the scenes in uh uh, uh, a B movie from American International called uh, Wild in the Streets, where an 18 year old uh, rock star becomes president of the U.S. and they put all the uh, older folks into a concentration camp. Whoa. And so, it, and that's called Wild in the Streets. It starred um, Millie Perkins uh, and was written by Robert Tom, who she had a daughter, who they had a daughter together, Lily Perkins. Hi, Lily. <laughs> anyway um and uh it's kind of it kind of fits in it kind of fits in with everything that was going on in the 60s and i sort of put it in the category of uh of these uh apocalyptic films that are leading up to this whole rapture idea um but anyways the, the chick tracks had had these and then you can see all the 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 little weird pictures on you have the beast one and you notice the little child there who's barely old enough to even know what's going on it's got its head stamped so i guess that little kid's going to hell uh and uh you know that's the kind of stuff that like would really get to me as a child because it's like i'm like going okay even at 11 years old and you know 12 years old i'm getting that okay that's a little five-year-old how are they going to even know whether or not to to accept jesus at that point correct you know so i mean they're preaching this and then you go over to this this last slide here where they got this little hippie beverly hills billy hillbilly's truck with a guillotine on the back and they're going around chopping people's heads off because they don't have the mark of the beast um and at this point seriously terrible yeah, I mean, and this was this was these are real comic books. It was like um, my aunt was like really big one for passing these out. Now, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and the thing the thing is, my aunt, my aunt, um, she grew up, she grew up with you know my mom, but um, she was uh, the sister of one of my. Um, other cousin, uh, my other uncle's wives, who married um, well, my younger uncle later on, but she was, she she had had a time away from where she wasn't even into Christianity or whatever, and she was out carousing, having her sinning days, which she called them. But my mom was, you know, Christian s- straight through, like since she was she was little, so um, she just never got that, like. It, that this whole rapture thing, she never got that from, from the Bible. And then my aunt starts, she, she gets converted around the same time in about 1971 and starts bringing all this hell Lindsay stuff and these chick tracks over and stuff to us and talking about the rapture every time we, uh, we, uh, came along and this and this you'll find really funny is one time uh Jan, um, she was over at my house, uh, my house, it was in 1980 and, uh, Boingo Boingo was, <laughs> was Uncle Boingo was on uh, the uh, Jay Leno or not Jay Leno um, the other guy David Letterman show performing and she's she's going look Louise look Louise that's what people look like after the rapture <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, Uncle Boingo so, you know Danny Elfman with his you know bright red hair and you know, dog collar on and stuff it was kind of funny wow. Yeah, you know, well, the joke I, is, I used to be a big Boingo fan before I figured out, you know, you know, before essentially before Hans and I did the whole series, music. music, mind control, and psychobiology. And you know, for those of you who haven't watched that series, you really should. You know, people give me a hard time. Jan is such a, you know, conservative now. He hates rock and roll. Well, you know, we did a whole like thirty some odd hours series exposing the entire agenda behind the pop culture and the music and the drugs and sex and the, you know, the degeneracy that they're all selling. And it's funded t- uh, primarily by the CIA, MI6, et cetera. So, you know, there's a whole layout of information there that we've provided people to understand it in depth. And it's not just, I, you know, I hate music now. I mean, that's nonsense. No. And the thing is, if you do not join the club, you do not get 
the fame. And right, well, yeah, yeah, and and that's all it is. Myself, I I prefer to listen to classical music, but I was very into punk rock, uh, gothic music, things like that in, in the past. But now I just I prefer to listen to classical music. Um, I just think it's healthier for people. Um, it doesn't have it doesn't have a, a, a solid beat bogging bogging you down. Um, it's it's not it's not so concise to, it's clarifying your brain it actually allows you to think so i i pref- i i uh, say listen to classical music i mean there are some weird things happening there like with mozart and his masonic stuff and things like that but it is, i think it's a better option it's, for it's people. less broken and degenerate than most of the other stuff i've been checking out um bluegrass recently is another option as well i've been exploring stuff that you know, five, 10 years ago, I would have never listened to. So at least it's like, wow, you know, there's actually, you know, other exactly. music out there than, than rock, you know? And it's like when you're, you know, I'm 47 now. And, and when you turn on the radio, it's like, okay, Eagles again, Led Zeppelin again, Beatles again. Can I really listen? Okay. Wait, that was 56,721 times I've heard that song. Do I really need to hear this crap again? You know? Yeah. And I'll tell you this, people, too. There are plenty of independent musicians out there that aren't, you know, promoting, like, was that Jay Z guy seeing he's a part of the Illuminati? Forget all the mainstream people. There are plenty of people out there worldwide producing music on their own. Listen to them. Give them give them your money. Stop giving it to these six corporations or four corporations or whatever it is. Go independent. I mean, you're going to find a lot, a lot more variety of music, and you're probably going to have a lot less chance of being uh, – trying to be you have your brain manipulated into weird ways because it is quite possible with music that's one of my other other things that i i do is i, I try to study the effects of music on people and uh, it's uh you can do some pretty pretty freaky things with tones but that's another story because we got to get on to this yeah, well you know so, they can go back and check out the, my all my shows with hans and we've broken all of that down for people to understand so you know I, I, really, I spoke to hans recently so maybe we can have him back on sometime in the near future uh, a lot of people are asking for him he's he's i really enjoy yeah he was the most popular guest he's been on like 30 35 times or so you know I really enjoy Hans Hans Hans's, Hans's input to, to this show. He's 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 he has some great insights. Um, I just I, I applaud Hans if you're listening. You're doing some really great work. Now um, I'm just going to backtrack a while and uh, uh, on some things here, and then we can uh, probably uh, close up this part of the show um, uh, and and uh start up n- next week with um with uh how it's uh, sort of uh gets into uh, the new age movement and or whatever you want to call it i mean um it has been sort of um uh whatever it's taken over by rapture theory thought i mean it's, if we can yeah, yeah this whole of- straw man of christianity Yes. So now uh, the slide here is, uh, let's see, what is it? Uh, slide uh, 49, 50s, 60s, and 70s overview. Now, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to a film in 1951, which is called Five, which is actually a, um, uh, a nuclear apocalypse film. However, what interests me about this one in this discussion is that um, the film Five was shown in um, the 1989 film Great Balls of Fire about Jerry Lee Lewis. And um, they showed a picture of the nuclear blast going off and some scenes from the film of these five survivors of this nuclear war. Now, when this film was shown on the television set when uh, Jerry Lee Lewis and uh, his cousin Myra were watching this show, um, Jerry Lee's going, 
Well, that there's the apocalypse in your Bible. So um, this is just the thing, how they take this really obscure little film and place it in this movie that's really, really popular about a uh, rock and roller who is also the cousin of Jimmy Swagger. And, you know, that movie got a lot of airplay. So they're showing this uh, nuclear, like, what do you call it? A uh, um, mushroom cloud going up, which also looks like the uh, God Cthulhu in the Lovecraft stories, like I said before. And you got Jerry Lee Lewis going, that's the apocalypse in your Bible. And so that's in 1951. Now, now in 19... Can I ahead. interrupt you for a second, Mark? I just wanted to be, uh, you know, make a point here that I think is important for people to understand, you know, that there isn't this rapture and this stuff mentioned in the, at the, in the Bible and that this is all a straw man of Christianity and all doesn't mean that there isn't a rampant promotion of Satanism and attempt to create the fall through the counterculture and drugs and new age movements and the media and the, you know, music pop culture at all, you know getting people caught up in sex, drugs, rock and roll, and all types of iniquity. And we can see it everywhere out there now. So I just wanted to differentiate that, you know, we're, you know, we're just letting people know that, you know, you can fall and get caught into that stuff, but there is a way to live in truth and honor. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that's exactly. You know, and that's, that's the thing is that this rapture stuff is the other side is another catch net to get those people that, I think they're think they're doing think they're being good um and think they're being think they're being a christian is another way of getting them caught up into this whole uh world that they're trying to create like you know huxley's blueprint and i believe it is now in 1959 though another film came out the world of the flesh and the devil and that's about three people that find themselves in a world where everybody has disappeared now in this film there is no mention of the rapture whatsoever. Um, there is a mention of, okay, this is doomsday. This is the end of the world on like on different, like a, what do you call it? Um, newspapers you'll see on the streets of this barren world. And they filmed it like an early like on Sunday morning in New York or something like that. It was, it was a really creepy film, but even at that time, when that movie was played on TV, nobody in our family or our church mentioned that this movie had anything to do with anything called a rapture. So again, the rapture was just a fringe thing uh, at that time in 1959 and when it was aired and uh, was, uh, I think it was 1966 on uh, television for the first time. Now, um, that brings us to 1968, uh, the, the movie Rosemary's Baby came out, and that's a, uh, about where um, they're trying to create the, uh, the Antichrist or, or, you know, have Rosemary be impregnated by the devil so she would be, um, bring the Antichrist in the world and could take over the world. Also in 1968, the movie that I referenced earlier called Wild in the Streets uh, came out about the youth taking over and putting all the old people in concentration camps, which was really a freaky movie for older people mm. at that time. I mean, it's like my dad personally thought that um, young people should, uh, like if they were fighting for the country, they should be allowed to vote. But um, it was uh, the church, the, uh, the church you're going to, they thought it was like, they thought it was the end of the world that uh, 18 year olds were allowed to vote. Um, it's that's a that question's already been debated and settled, but it was a big thing, so that's why I've included Wild in the Streets in this one. Mark, let me just, just hold you right there. I just want to say thanks to four people who just donated. Okay, I belong cool. in the kitchen, gave another five bucks. Dan Simmons, 499. Thank you, Kate, 499. Polygonal Construction, uh, five dollars. Thanks all of you so much for your support, we really appreciate it. Uh, anybody else who wants to throw up a super chat or donate on the website or the new Patreon account, thank you so much. Okay, so that brings us to 1968 and uh, Night of the Living Dead. 
Mm. Okay, Night of the Living Dead, it was constantly mentioned throughout the, the film um, um, on the uh, little uh, newscast that were going on here and there about um, some think it might be a, a, a biblical apocalypse or whatever like that, but the rapture was never mentioned. Had George Romero even heard about the rapture thing and that, that would have been in that movie. It would have been. I mean, come on. Um, then 1972, we're back to a Thief in the Night. Um, or, excuse me. I got ahead of myself there. 1970, the Manson family goes on trial with the Tate LaBianca movies. And the Book of Revelations was referenced over and over and over again in the media because of everything was going on in the trial where um, supposedly, you know, Manson uh, thought the Beatles Revolution number nine, uh, Revelations number nine, and they were trying to start this race war and stuff like that. Nobody was talking about the rapture. And I know I was a little kid, but I was a tuned in little kid. And my parents, I talked with my parents about this, this stuff, and, and I knew what was going on, but people were not talking about anything to do with the rapture at that time. During that, they were just talking about how Charles Manson was a flipping hippie weirdo and how he, uh, how he, um, um, how he was uh, using the Bible inappropriately. Then also at that time, we had the six day, six day war over in, um, over in Israel, we've explored that already. Um, in 1970s, the, the Lake Great Planet Earth came out, and then the novels 666 and 1000 by Salem Tehran. 1972, A Thief in the Night was released, and that sort of started uh, all the fundamentalist churches and the evangelical churches on this whole rapture craze. But that was quickly replaced in 1973 when The Exorcist came out, where everybody got into this whole demonology thing and all of a sudden everybody was thinking people were possessed or by demons or whatever like that and it didn't help matters that um lsd was very widespread at that time even in the 70s and a lot of people were freaking out on lsd and people were thinking and other uh, you know pcp other drugs like that and th and people were thinking they were possessed <laughs> and uh it happened in like a lot of uh, a lot of uh, churches and uh, uh, church colleges and stuff. I would hear stories about um, kids from going to uh, the, the different colleges associated with the church we were going to, and uh, getting uh, dosed with LSD or saying that they were dosed with LSD, and then and, uh, and people are thinking they were possessed by demons, and it was no, no, I'm on acid, <laughs> things like that. So that was happening at that time. Now, in 1973, also, um, it was kind of weird because there was also a sort of a nod to the Rapture movie uh, on ABC's Movie of the Week, which the ABC's Movie of the Week were, were a really big deal. And that time, everybody seemed to watch ABC Movie of the Week. It was like uh, Dancing with the Stars is now or something like that. And they had a, a, one of their movies in 1973 was uh, Where Have All the People Gone? Now, this could be argued as a take on the rapture uh, doctrine because it basically had uh, people, um, there was a sun flare and then all these people would were sort of disappeared and their clothes were just lying there, but there was sort of like this salty substance. Where, where their bodies were. And uh, Peter Graves, the guy that played uh, Phelps on the original Mission Impossible, him and uh, his character and his, his children were trying to get back to um, his wife in what was probably a 150 mile journey. <laughs> and it took them days to get there. And there was, they kept on going to all these places where they would find these clothes of people laying there with the salty substance and things like that. You can also see that on YouTube. So I'm thinking that that sort of was um, a mainstream sort of like just putting it there. Okay, um, this is not quite a rapture movie, but it's going to put in your head that idea that, you know, maybe one day you'll be there and people will be gone and there will be nothing but their clothes left. Now, after that, 
1975, we come to 1975, and uh, that's when the first Omen movie was released. Mm. Now, this fits more in with, like, more, as like, I say, with the Catholic doctrine or stuff like that. Um, but it also sort of got caught up in this whole snowball, the rapture doctrine uh, throughout the uh, years after it was released. And as a whole, the 1970s were, were really filled with all these apocalyptic films um, and films about demons and stuff like that. And it all sort of started merging with, um, with uh, uh, the whole rapture doctrine, charismatic movement and things, things like that. And as we'll see in the next show, um, it also started merging the whole rapture thing and demonology and the apocalypse things started started taking over uh what would be termed a new age movement in the 1980s um and now in 1981 there was a film called uh and so i'm keeping this in with the 70s but i'm going to end it with with this little comparison here in 1981 there was a film release called years of the beach beast and now um in 1983, there was a film, um, a TV film called The Day After. You know, I was in like third or fourth grade, maybe, maybe fifth when that film came out. And that scared the crap out of everybody, you know? Yeah. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty big deal. That film was a pretty big deal. But the, the thing is that I noticed from this Christian film, The Years of the Beast and The Day After, they have two characters that are very similar, played by two actors that are very similar in appearance. Um, now, the day after has a character um, played by Steven Gutenberg, um, a hitchhiking college student called uh, Steve, named Steven Klein, who sort of finds his way to, to um, seeking safety with this family. In a, in a basement and then he befriends daughter and sort of a, uh, you know, is a, a stable support for this family as they're dealing with this whole nuclear war that's come off. Now in the years of the beast, um, um, Steve, uh, Jerry Hauser um, plays a drifter who has the uh, named Gary Reed who has the same sort of function in the film, Here's the Beast. And these two actors, um, if we can just go to, um, I believe it's slide, slide 55, and their characters look forever the same within, within these oh, two yeah. movies. I mean, it's just like so apparent. And so you can get these these movies, these two, these two movies mixed up if you watched both of them. So it basically it's combining, it, I I think that they're they're they they were aware of each other and they uh, they are working um, in tan uh, in tangent to to sort of blur the lines between um, uh, nuclear apocalypse and the rapture thing, which brings us to oh guess who our old friend Orson Welles oh. and. <laughs> Yeah, like, <laughs> like we, we you know, know wow, I've investigated, investigated him quite, quite a lot. lot. So, you know, he, this familiar name in 1979, Mr. Wells narrates a movie based on Hal Lindsey's book, The Light Great Planet Earth. And the very next year, Mr. Wells narrates a movie called The Man Who Saw Tomorrow based on the prophecies of Nostradamus. And boom! All of a sudden, the New Age movement joins a whole rapture movement. <laughs> it, I mean, I saw this happen. It was weird. Yeah, I had well, gotten, yeah. I had gotten into. I had gotten into the New Age thing just because I was trying to get away from those 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 nutty rapture people, and all of a sudden they were there. Then they they mixed up everything with Edgar Casey and uh, mm. and also. Um, our friend uh, Larry Nimoy uh, 
Mr. Spock, he had a show from 1977 to 1982 uh, in called of. In Search Of, which they dealt with things like Casey, the Mayans, Dead Sea Scrolls. Well, um, you know, get I used to love that show. Yeah, me too. You know, and when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to watch many, but that was an investigative true series. But, you know, that's where a lot of the uh, 2012 mythos originated. Well, Michael Coe from Yale University, who is a CIA agent, and then he influences uh, Daniel Pinchbeck and Terrence McKenna. You know, McKenna, as I've exposed, was, you know, CIA and or FBI. You know, of course, uh, everybody flips out every time we talk about that. But, you know, and then this is that same doomsday thing that they are promoting. I'm probably jumping ahead on you there. Yeah, well, time. I'll just say a preview for next week. Time Wave Zero, guess what? It comes from Rapture, rapture Doctrine, you guys. <laughs> Terrence, Terrence didn't just come up with this crap on his own. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm going to show uh, Terrence's uh, uh, intelligence uh, back, uh, connections from his background on here on screen, just so people can get a little bit of an idea there. But CIA cybernetics, John D., whom we exposed the other day, was the uh, uh, spy for Queen Elizabeth. Um, he was uh, influenced by Pierre Tillard de Chardin. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. My wife, Tillard, will... Tillard de Chardin, and he yeah. was also he he's the guy that sort of started the whole New Age. New Age yeah, thing. and he was a Catholic Jesuit or or what have you. Let me see. Jesuit. Me... Yeah, Society of Jesuits, right? And uh, Catholic Roman Catholic is claimed, but. So, you know, this is all, you know, what flowed into Terrence McKenna along with the eugenicist, uh, oh, uh, John uh, Bullsh, uh, B.S. Haldane, uh, <laughs> and then yeah. uh, Lawrence. I mean, you know, y you see the whole pattern. Aldous Huxley, who is the head of MK Ultra, is right there and a big uh, Fabian socialist and, uh, you know, member of the Century Club. And, of course, people try to spin that I've, uh, what club I've said he was involved in. But, uh, you know, so this, you know, and people can go into the database through the website and go through and check all of this, these citations and everything. But, you know, it's not just McKenna's own admission that he was recruited that we're talking about. You know, we're talking about his entire background, his education at all is involved in all of this stuff. And he was trained to promote this, you know, this same lie to everybody. And you got to kill culture, your, your culture, your family, your heritage is bad. We have to have a you know, one world religion and consciousness and all this stuff that all of the, you know, the psychedelic crazed hippies promote now. And I admit I used to be one of them, you know, but you wake up and you grow up and you realize that it was all a, a bad trick and a bad joke to, you know, prevent you from learning about what truth is and living and walking in truth. And a bad also, trip. Nice. <laughs> it's a bad trip, really. But um, I'll also say <laughs> at the same time that all this was happening is when uh, Elaine Pagel's book, The Gnostic Gospels, came out. And so that got all added into the mix as well. And, um, you know, basically, the Gnostic Gospels, I'm going to say this to folks, actually go read them instead of saying what they are based on what you heard they are because a lot of the spin that comes out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, Edgar Casey stuff, the Mayan stuff, and the Rapture stuff being all uh, mixed together is just because of people listening to other people and not actually reading the stuff themselves. And, you know, anything that I present to you I'm not asking you to take on um, like Elaine Pagels is tied to the gospel of Judas as well. <laughs> ding, ding. Yeah. Just look, look at the stuff yourself, people look them up. If these films, I look them up there. You can see it in them. Don't, don't just take my word from it. It's like, uh, go to the appeal to the authority of the actual thing not a person right yeah you know yeah look at the research look at the link study the books yourself you know stop attacking us because we told you to read something and you're too lazy to do it and somebody else told you yon irvin is crazy and you know so <laughs> yeah. and you know yon um, um, irvin is this or that because he uses that trivium and the trivium isn't found in nature no but we are and we use it asking who what where when why and how 
to study nature. I mean, it's just you got to use a little bit of that gray matter up there. I'm just going to put something out here that's really hilarious since we brought up Larry Nimoy. It's kind of funny that just prior to whole this whole rapture thing being put on society, you know, uh, via like great planet earth hal Lindsay and the thing with orson wells and these weird little movies and stuff it's really funny that just prior to that there was a little show called star trek that had this thing in there called a transporter where people would beam up <laughs> and just sort of disappear and sparkle and go mm. up into a spaceship now if you know anything about that they weren't supposed to actually have a transporter but there's this story that Gene Roddenberry had problems getting his um, um, shuttlecraft made for, for the movie. So they had to come up with something really quick to get people on and off the ship. Um, right now, I'm at a point where maybe I'm not buying that. And <laughs> that transporter was put there to as a part of this whole psyop for the rapture. And that might sound crazy, but um, all this stuff kind of, kind of is kind of getting a little bit, kind of gets a little bit loopy after a while. And so yeah. I mean, just putting that on the table, I'm just putting that on the table. Maybe it's part of it. Maybe it's not, but, um, this is where we, we've sort of at, as far as, um, this segment of it goes and, uh, um, we can, we can go like one more maybe if you want and just say, um, folks, just go back and watch some of Reagan's speeches in the 1980s because he did a whole heck of a lot for promoting this whole rapture apocalypse thing for his presidency in some of his speeches. He was the president that wanted to be... Um, uh, he thought he was going to be there for the big Armageddon. He was the president that was uh, caught on a microphone uh, pretending he was going to war with the Russians. <laughs> he, uh, and also, he has links to the Plymouth Brethren. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so, so um, um, if we want to stop it there because my next slide is uh, New Agers adapting. Sure, yeah. Rapture. Yeah, well, you, we can stop there. We're already at two hours and almost 15 minutes here. So, you know, the issue is, is when you get past an hour and a half, I mean, you know. It, it, gets, it gets long. Right. Well, you know, most people only have like a two or three minute attention span now. So, you know, it's like, you know. We lose yeah. people that when it's this long. So if we break it up, hopefully, you know, they'll they'll come back and catch more of it. So, you know, Mark, this is great material. I hope, you know, we've brought a lot of understanding to this straw man Christianity, this straw man of logos at all that, uh, you know, that people have, you know, fallen into all of this uh, Protestantism for that matter. And you know, just you start waking up, start reading these books for yourself, you know, use the trivium method so that you learn, first of all, how to find truth, and then you can figure out how to live in truth. And then once that happens, everything else starts to unfold. And you can, you know, you can uh, just begin to see and understand things on your own. And that's, that's what we need, you know, more of people that can think and stand up on their own. We're not looking for a bunch of thoughtless drones learning logic and learning how to think and learning and walking in truth means you aren't living a lie and that's you know what they want to keep us all from and i really think that's the whole agenda i mean you see them you know marlene dobkin de rios who is a major psychedelic sc <clears throat> scholar she promoted you know uh originally promoted ayahuasca for antinomianism, which of course is against the law. And that means against natural law or the laws of nature or God's law. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all of this was used to create hypersuggestion, as I call them, suggestogens. And, uh, you know, to, to influence, and as she said, you know, to influence or hypnotize the youth into the, the culture that the CIA and SRI and Tavistock wants to create, and that's promoting all of the, the transgender, all of the, 
you know, don't have a family, all of the nonsense, there is no right or wrong, you know, all of this left-hand path uh, confusion stuff. And, you know, these people that get caught into the left-hand path and believe that there is no right or wrong, that's the ultimate form of slavery. You know, I mean, that's, you know, complete non-thinking anymore. It's like, well, I'm just going to accept everything. Everything is good. Everything is okay. No, it's not. You know, and it's, you know, that's the idiocy that's allowed to, you know, be perpetuated on society that's really tearing us down. And we see, you know, now that homosexual marriage has been passed, now they want to promote bestiality and, uh, you know, uh, child pornography and these things. So we can see, you know, each time we give them a step, you know, they're going to take five more and they're going to keep going and they're going to keep going until society is totally fallen and dead. And that's that's the real goal is to make you know, the society fall as a whole on top of the individual falls. So, you know, by living and walking in truth and honor, by getting yourself on the right-hand path, you know, and people say, well, the right-hand path is an occult term. No, it's just the right hand of God, getting on the right-hand path, walking and living in truth, using reason and logic, asking who, what, where, when, why, and how to investigate things and to Know for yourself what is true and what is false. A contradiction is always a lie or an error. There are no contradictions in nature. Did you have a point you wanted to add there, Mark? Um, I was just going to say it's like basically, um, if um, you don't want, if you if you wouldn't want something done in your house to you or your family or your pet. Don't do it to other people. I mean, and a lot of the stuff on the left-hand path is stuff you wouldn't want done to your, you, yourself, your house, or your family, or your pet. I mean, it, 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 it's maybe it's as simple as, as that going down to like um, the golden rule, doing unto others as you'd have done down to them. Right. And, and, and I can't even, you know, it's like, we've heard that so many times in life, but do we really think about it in terms of, in terms of, of all these other things on a societal level too, and what we promote on a societal level and things like that. It also includes that. Now I'm not telling you not to watch things on TV, not to go to the movies and stuff. Go, go and see them because you know what, if you are looking at them, but see them with like a trivium, trivium in here because if you're really looking at these things they're telling you they're telling you a story about how people <laughs> how you're being screwed <laughs> and how right. you're being manipulated and it's like i'm not going to be like uh somebody that used to be on this show who's like oh don't watch that don't watch that don't watch that no go ahead and do it because it's like i'm confident that if you follow the Tribune, if you live in Logos, that you will see the same things we're seeing in these <laughs> things. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. You know, so, you know, it's like, look up these movies on, on, on YouTube or, or whatever, and you will see, you will see just how, how, how nutty, nutty some of this stuff is and how it's, it, it's destroying people and destroying churches and destroying families and and things like that and getting people just living in fear and quite honestly if you're coming if you're coming to your spirituality from a sense of fear or um you know or it's it's just like the people like they are going like oh i experienced ego death well guess what folks if you think you've experienced ego death you still got an ego. <laughs> well, you know, interestingly, the worst people that I interact with, having come out, you know, being pro-psychedelic and writing books about it originally, and then waking up and realizing that it was the CIA promoting all of this stuff and yeah. everything, the worst people that I continually come across, without exception, are the hippies and the, the counterculture psychedelic people. I mean... They are the nastiest, meanest people that I deal with hands down, you know, and sorry for those of you out there who are still in that. But, you know, it's like, you know, hopefully shows like this help you to begin to to uh, see things. So, you know, this you, you, can't, you can't you can't live with it. You can't live your life 
with a, 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 um, a was it ad baculum as an ad baculum fallacy and this is what like a lot of these people do they want to beat you over the head with it threaten you okay like this is these people that are doing this whole thing oh you have to cleanse your pineal gland or you're not um uh, you know not a part of the um uh, the uh, group or whatever or cleanse your chakras or not part or the same people are saying if you don't accept jesus in this one particular way you're not going to get raptured so what they're using is an appeal to appeal to force oh something bad is going to happen to you if you don't believe exactly like we do well i'm sorry but you know that's a that's one of the main fallacies and if you're using that whatever conversions you get from it are invalid because if you have if if you have to coerce somebody into something and put them under they're under duress it's not true it's just not true all those people that are like oh i'm getting saved because i don't want to experience the rapture and I don't want to uh, be uh, a victim of the Antichrist. I don't want to go to hell. Right, they, you know, and, and it's all it's all an easy way out, like the divine grace stuff. Rather than doing yeah. good works, you know, striving to live in truth and logos, live in honor all the time, being the best man you can be, being the best woman you can be, etc. It's like, oh, you know, it's all done. It's all taken care of. You know, those people are chosen. You know, it's like. You know, like yeah. we said earlier, the divine grace thing. It's this. It's just another way of re rewording uh, uh, the chosen people. So you know, people need to see it and and just wake up. We should probably wrap it up here. We're almost at two and a half hours. Yeah. Um, save some for next time. So I know you're on a roll okay. now, but no problem. So no uh, problem. No problem. Again. What's that? I can get on. I can get on a roll next week too. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I, we look forward to it. So. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I'll, let's see, actually, yeah, so we can do next Tuesday, I believe, uh, so uh, we'll see you then hopefully at 5 p.m. next Tuesday, and uh, thank you so much, Mark, for taking the time to put this present presentation together. I know it uh, took you quite a bit of work and everything, so, you know, people really need to see this stuff. Thanks also to my wife, Holly, over there, and uh, for all of her help and support. And, uh, you know, so we'll see you all next week. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks all for your support. Please hit the super chat if you can, or go to uh, the Still Gnostic Media donation button, or go to the new Patreon link that I've posted up in the chat group there. Thanks so much, and uh, we will see you all next week. Bye, everybody. Have a great Good day. Night. Good night.